Hi everyone, welcome to Knowledge Quest 5. This is a longer Knowledge Quest because we will be looking at both fatigue review as well as shaft materials, layout, and stress. So some top level information about shafts. Generally, they are rotating members and they most often have circular cross section. So the circular cross section prevents warping. So that's why we use a circular cross section over say a square or rectangular cross section. Usually shafts are used in rotating applications, but you can have linear shafts and the video will kind of talk about that. They're used to transmit power or motion and provide an axis of rotation or oscillation and control the motion of other elements such as pulleys, flywheels, gears, cranks, rockets, or bearings. So pause here and using the text or other online resources, briefly read about what each of these mechanical components are to the extent that you feel like you'd be able to identify them in the quiz. So we'll start with an intro to shafts video. So as you're watching, pay attention to the following. Why is case or surface hardening important for shafts? And name a couple of methods of securing components such as gears and bearings to rotary shafts. On the latest series of Mech Minutes, we will review the features that must be considered when selecting a shaft in your application. Shafts are typically used for three main reasons, support, transmitting power, or to transport a load. Musumi offers countless styles of shafting. Let's start by deciphering the four main groups, linear, rotary, posts, and rods. Linear shafts are utilized in load transport applications. These shafts made with complementary accessories such as linear bushings. Linear shafts are composed of steel, but standard carbon steel is relatively soft. The direct contact with mating accessories can cause the steel to wear prematurely. Because of this, Musumi Induction hardens its linear shaft, also known as case hardening, to withstand the wear of the bushing riding directly on the shaft. Rotary shafts are designed to be used in power transmission applications. Oftentimes, rotary and drive shafts are used interchangeably. While they're used in identical applications, there are important differences. These will be discussed in a subsequent episode. Musumi's rotary shafts offer a plethora of alterations in order to accommodate the various mating components. Wrench flats, keyways, and retaining ring grooves are only a few of the standard alterations offered to join your rotary accessories. Posts are commonly used as support features within an application. Also known as standoffs, these shafts are meant for static support. Because posts and its mating components are not in motion, tolerances are not as critical, leading to a reduced cost. Rods, also referred to as bar stock, are the last of the four main types of shafting. These are the most economical solutions for general and unique applications. Musumi's rod selection offers the widest selection of material, including titanium, brass, various resins, and many others. Beginning with the proper shaft in your design will ensure your application will perform as expected, not to mention prevent over-designing, thus saving precious dollars. So shaft materials is covered in chapter 7-2 in your textbook. So read through that, paying attention to the following two questions. What controls shaft rigidity, the material, geometry, or both? And then two, when starting a shaft design, what material is appropriate for the first iteration? Then this next video, we'll talk about shaft surface selection. It's also short um, to pay attention to our, what are key considerations when selecting shaft material or surface treatment. And then what type of material is best at resisting corrosive environments? Previously on Meg Minutes Shafting Series, we covered shaft selection differences between four main types, linear shafts, rotary shafts, posts, and rods. 
All past videos are posted for your viewing pleasure to get caught up to this week's episode of Material and Surface Treatment Selection. The primary elements to consider when selecting material or surface treatments is wear resistance and corrosion resistance. Masumi offers linear shafts in four grades of steel, 52100 bearing steel, 440C stainless steel, 1045 carbon steel, and 304 stainless steel. Stainless steel is highly recommended in applications where corrosion may be a concern. For additional protection, Masumi offers two optional surface treatments, hard chrome plating and low temperature black chrome. Hard chrome plating provides excellent wear resistance, whereas low temperature black chrome offers exceptional corrosion resistance. Depending on the severity of the environment, Masumi offers different levels of protection, with low temperature black chrome as the highest level of corrosion resistance. Rotary shafts are offered in carbon steel and 300 level stainless steel. 300 level stainless is known for its superb corrosion resistance. However, for applications that demand carbon steel, Masumi offers two surface treatments to protect against damp environments. Black oxide offers mild corrosion resistance, prevents light reflection, and is the most economical option. Electrolyst nickel plating offers excellent corrosion resistance, provides additional hardening for better wear resistance, but more costly than standard plating. Posts offer an identical material selection as rotary shafts with one key addition, polyacetal. Lightweight and resistant to many chemicals, polyacetal is one of the most economical options for structural applications. For everything else, Musumi offers rods in various materials. Carbon alloy steel, stainless steel, tool steel, aluminum, brass, titanium, and resin. Please stay tuned to the next episode where we will discuss tolerances and different fits. Chapter 7.3 is a really good chapter. It gives some design guidelines for shaft layout. So I won't read these all to you, but you're going to um, read that chapter and then answer the following seven questions. And then next, this is a figure I just pulled from the text. I like it because there's a lot going on, um, but it's an example of a step shaft supporting a gear, in this case, a helical gear. and um, Essentially, can you determine the function of the shoulders in the shaft and can you locate the bearings? So the functions of the shoulders, for example, are to position the bearings where they need to go. Also to position the gear itself. So the shoulders help position everything on the shaft. And then in this case, there are two bearings. So bearing one and again bearing two. Those are both tapered roller bearings because they're rolling elements are at an angle. We are not going to be analyzing tapered roller bearings in this class, but they are often used in conjunction with helical gears because helical gears produce um, what is known as a thrust load or an axial load. So components like helical or double gears and tapered roller bearings produce forces that act axially or through the shaft. So in these situations, you need to somehow transfer the axial or the thrust load through a bearing to the ground. So that's what is being depicted here. We have a radial load that acts radially through the gear. And then because of the helix angle, there's also a force that's produced through the shaft. So in general, it's best to only have one bearing during the axial load, especially for long shafts. Okay, so stress concentrations in shafts is um, going to be one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to. And the, the interesting thing about shaft design is that you, you don't often know the total geometry of your shaft at the outside of a design, so you have to estimate your stress concentrations. Um, but usually, components are of standard proportions, meaning, for example, that you have to have a certain amount of shoulder height to support a bearing. So these standard proportions are what we use to estimate stress concentration factors. But it's very important that once the geometry of your shaft has been set and you have a working final model or drawing, you have to go back and refine your um, actual stress concentration factors. You can't use these initial estimates 
which are shown on this slide, table 7-1. So put this in your analysis tool for sure. So table 7-1 gives some first estimate stress concentration values. Um, and you can see how the stress concentrations are actually not specified by the geometry itself, rather by the type of geometry. So a sharp shoulder fillet, a well-rounded shoulder fillet, two types of key seats, and a retaining ring groove. So just looking at the numbers, you can see, for example, that a retaining ring groove is a lot worse for stress concentrations in bending. So what we would have with the retaining ring groove something like this. So that compared to a simple shoulder, this is going to have the higher stress concentration. So I guess intuitively it kind of just makes sense of looking at that drawing, but it's interesting to note that, for example, retaining ring grooves do yield such high stress concentration, so you don't want to like have them all over your shaft. Um, yes, so, okay, I said that. That needs to go in your analysis tool. So short, short uh, info on shafts, because we're going to dive into fatigue, but a little summary here. Shafts are used in all rotating machinery. Steel is usually the choice of material to obtain high stiffness for low deflections. Shafts may be of soft, low carbon steel, or medium to high carbon steel for higher strength, or if um, a really hard surface finish is needed for wear resistance. Machine shafts usually have stepped shoulders for axial location of attached elements, such as bearings and gears. But note that these shoulders create stress concentrations that must be considered in stress analysis. Keyways or things like interference fits also create stress concentrations. And then lastly, the loading on shafts is usually a combination of torsion and bending, either or both of which can be time varying. So when you see this term, time varying, that means that we have to do a fatigue analysis. So you learned about fatigue failure in 328, and fatigue is a really important set of concepts for 329. All right, so we'll start with a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so what is fatigue failure? It's basically the failure that occurs from stresses that vary with time, or that fluctuate between different levels. And this failure phenomenon was first noticed in the 1800s when railroad car axles began failing after even just a short time in service. And this was a mystery because these axles had been designed with the most advanced engineering expertise at the time, but it was the 1800s, so our knowledge was pretty much based on static loading scenarios. So static load would be um, one that induces a stress that doesn't vary with time or fluctuate between different levels. So another interesting observation was made about the way these axles were failing. They were failing, they were kind of behaving like brittle materials when they failed, meaning that they exhibited sudden brittle-like fractures, even though the axles were made out of ductile material. So people began studying these failing axles and noticed that because of the way the axles were fixed to the wheels, they rotated with the wheel. Hence, the axles were undergoing what we call cyclic loading. And we're going to look at what we call fully reverse loading, which is a type of cyclic loading on, um, in more detail in the next slide. But this just simply hadn't been studied yet because dynamic loads were pretty much a new phenomenon that came about with the introduction of steam-powered machinery. All right, so let's picture a rotating shaft subject to a force. It's got to be held in place by something, so it has some bearings. This looks pretty familiar to all of those simply supported beams that you've been studying the past couple of years. So in a static loading situation, we draw this pretty exaggerated. You would have compression on top and tension in the bottom fibers. The difference in fatigue loading is that the shaft is rotating. So a point that was initially in tension 
once that shaft rotates 180 degrees, that point is now in compression, and the point that was initially in compression is now in tension. So that's why um, we see these sinusoidal waves to describe, at least for here, this is fully, re fully reverse loading, meaning that the magnitude of the, you know this formula, probably one you should get tattooed on your forearm, in case you forget, um, sigma equals mc over i, so that is our bending stress formula. And it has equal magnitude because we're fully reversing the load, but it's just fluctuating between tension compression, tension compression. There are other types of cyclic loading. So you can have a, kind of like a mid-range load induced and have a sinusoidal wave off of that mid-range value, but we'll talk about that more later. Fully reverse is the simplest case, and it's where all of the SN diagrams and a lot of the equations that we use to study fatigue are, um, are developed. So it's like our baseline case. Okay, go back to the history lesson. Even in 1839, the mechanism of fatigue was still not understood, but lots of observations were made to confirm that ductile materials subjected to fluctuating loads were really prone to these brittle-like failures. And it was kind of talked about as though the material had become embrittled or tired, which is actually where the term fatigue came about. But interestingly, the broken halves of components that had failed in fatigue still retained their yield strength and their ductility. So it wasn't like fatigue loading was inherently changing the material's properties, but it was obviously affecting the failure mechanism. So a man named August Roller, I think I'm saying that right, a German engineer began testing axles to failure in a systematic way. And he discovered a really interesting relationship between the number of loading cycles and an axle strength. Simply put, the strength of the axles diminished as a function of the number of loading cycles. And that is depicted in what we call this SN curve. So fatigue strength, as a function of the number of cycles. So as cycles go up, the material's strength essentially goes down. But this diminishing strength levels off at a certain point, which we call the fatigue limit. It's also called the endurance limit. And this sort of magic point, it's not really a point, but around 1 million cycles is when at least steels, for example, exhibit what we call infinite strength, meaning that a steel component can withstand an infinite amount of cycles beyond one million without its strength diminishing. There's some caveats to that. For example, if you have, um, if something's always subjected to rust or corrosion, you're never gonna have an endurance limit. But again, we'll get to that later. So this is pretty interesting. And it kind of explains, um, why the axles had been failing after a short time in service, because it really doesn't take too long to get up to a million cycles, especially with you know, continual loading. Even though the axles had been designed according to the material static yield strength, which is significantly above the fatigue strength. Okay, so fatigue is a big deal. It's a really important topic for engineers. And most failures in machinery are due to, to fatigue failures, to so these time-varying loads. So uh, kind of an older statistic, it was the best one I could find. The annual cost of fatigue of materials to the U.S. economy in 1892, which was before you were all born, I think, um, was about $100 billion, so about 3% of the GMP. And fatigue loading is prevalent, it's everywhere. It's way more common to find fatigue loading, or cyclic loading rather than static loading. So vehicles and aircrafts of all types, bridges, cranes, power plant equipment, offshore oil well structures, miscellaneous machinery and equipment, anything that's used on like a production line is obviously gonna be rotating. Um, I did not take this picture, but one of the first internships I did was at the National Wind Technology Center in Colorado. And it was really cool to see these huge wind turbine blades 
with weights attached and the weights would be put on there and they'd make it fluctuate. It was really noisy. But they're literally, you know, testing these blades to fatigue failure. So I have a video. 1954, and one of the world's first jet airliners takes off from Italy. The plane is the ultimate in high-speed luxury travel. But just 26 minutes into the flight, it explodes catastrophically. 35 people are dead. The tragedy stuns a nation. A team of investigators must solve the mystery of why this state-of-the-art aircraft disintegrated on a routine flight. What they discover in the wreckage will cause a turning point in the history of aviation and change passenger travel forever. Disasters don't just happen, they're a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down to those final seconds from disaster. Ten thirty one AM, January tenth, nineteen fifty four. Twenty six minutes to disaster. Flight seven eight one takes off from Rome Airport. The plane is designed with an exceptionally thin aluminium skin. Rivets punched into the aircraft during construction create microscopic manufacturing defects. On each flight, the pressurization system puts enormous strain on the fuselage, causing stress to the skin, especially around the windows and doors. Repeated pressurizations turn the manufacturing defects into fatigue cracks that get bigger with every flight. 19 minutes to disaster. Flight 781 climbs to 11,000 meters. As it ascends, the pressure increases and the aircraft's skin becomes more stressed. Would you like some tea, At 10.51 a.m., the Comet's pilot, Captain Gibson, sends a radio message. George Hamtrick from George York, Peter. Five seconds to disaster. A fatigue crack reaches two centimeters in length and the aircraft's skin rips apart. At 10.57 a.m., the shattered pieces of Flight 781 fall from the sky. 35 people are dead. All right, so when I show that video in 328, I pause and kind of use it as an opportunity to talk about our and your ethical responsibility for learning critical engineering concepts. And fatigue, I believe, is a really critical concept. I mean, anything that causes catastrophic failure, so the same could be said about column buckling, but as we talked about, fatigue loading is so prevalent in you know, everyday life, and it really is our responsible to understand it well. So, um, you know, learn it well. Don't just kind of skim it to get by. This at least in my opinion, is something that is really, really paramount to human health and safety. Okay, so as the video talked about, or showed actually, fatigue failures always begin at a crack. And it may be a crack that has been present since manufacturing or developed over time due to cyclic straining around stress concentrations. And that's what was happening in the fuselage with the, the rivets causing little stress concentrations. Each flight to the pressurized cabin was just causing those little micro cracks to grow and grow and grow. So there are three stages to failure, fatigue failure, crack initiation, so when the, the crack first starts, crack propagation, and then sudden fracture due to unstable crack growth. So this is why even ductile materials exhibit these catastrophic, really sudden failures. And this is also why we're always saying minimize stress concentrations, minimize stress concentrations, because even if you have a ductile material in static loading, stress concentrations aren't really aren't as big of a deal because you get that localized yielding and strain hardening. But with ductile materials and cyclic loading, fatigue loading, you can have a little micro crack and then over time your part will fail. 
So good design minimizes stress concentrations. The next thing to consider is this difference between components in the laboratory under fatigue loading versus components in real life under fatigue loading. And there will be very significant differences between the fatigue strength of a test specimen, so something that is polished and perfect, look at that nice line on this test specimen, it's been polished axially. That's gonna look a lot different than a component in service. So things like loading, shape, size, temperature, and corrosion all have a big impact on the fatigue strength of a component. The primary equation that we use to deal with fatigue strength is called the Marin equation. So this is something that you should have covered in 328, but we're going to review it here. So starting out, this SE prime. So this is the endurance limit of a test specimen. And the video talks about what endurance limit is. But we have to modify that test value endurance limit to better approximate the endurance limit of that component in service. So it's derated by all of these things, surface condition, size, load, temperature, reliability, and miscellaneous effects. And so you need to figure out each of those components individually and multiply them by SE prime to get the modified endurance limit. So the first step in these problems is determining SE prime, and that's a simple calculation. That is just one half SUT. So Ka is our surface condition modification factor, and this factor depends on the quality of the finish. So ranging from ground to machine or cold drawn to hot rolled as forged, so kind of degrading quality of surface finish as you go down the list and on the tensile strength of the part material. So very important here when you're putting this into your analysis tool, make sure you're using this table as it appears here in this video. There is a difference between the 10th edition of Shigley and the 11th edition of Shigley. This comes from the 11th edition of Shigley where the values have been updated from experiments that were done um, decades ago, but for some reason the, the updated factors didn't make their way into the um, book until the 11th edition. So to reiterate, these are the, the um, factor A and exponent B that you need to have in your analysis tool to be current. Size factor KB, this is probably the, the weirdest factor, so we'll do a little example. Um, but for rotating beam specimens, like the specimens in the lab, they're usually pretty small, about a third inch in diameter. For larger parts, a size factor is needed to account for the fact that larger parts fail at lower stresses due to a higher probability of flaws being present on the surface of that material. So this factor accounts for that. So if you have um, something that is rotating, so let's say you have a solid rotating shaft, the KB factor isn't that tricky. You just have to make sure that you are looking at your units. So are you in inches? Are you in millimeters? And what range is your diameter? So if you have something that's one inch, you would use this expression. If you had a shaft with a three inch diameter, you'd use this expression. But that's only for a shaft that is rotating. What do you do when you have a round bar in bending that is not rotating. So say you have a two inch diameter shaft that is non-rotating, what is its size factor? The first thing you have to do, and I'm not gonna go into this too much because it is 328 stuff, but you have to figure out the equivalent diameter. So the equivalent diameter is basically, it's kind of like accounting for the material that um, is more on the outside of the shaft but it is a simple calculation, so three, seven times two inches. So that is 0 
So what we do is use that equivalent diameter in the appropriate expression for KB. So now we have D, we have to use the equivalent diameter here, and that's always the kind of um, confusing part for people. So now we do 0 0.879 times 0 0.74 to the negative 0 0.107. So that is 0 0.907 for KB. Cool. How would this answer change if your shaft were rotating? In this case, we would use this expression because our D is two inches or above. Okay, so I won't do the math, but you see the process. Okay, so loading factor um, estimates of SC primed are typically obtained from completely reverse bending, and the video talked about what completely reverse bending is but we have to account in real life for different types of loading. So that's what KC does. So if it's bending, we have one. If it's just axial loading, we have 0.85. If you have a shaft that is only in torsion, you use 0.59. Um, here's a note. When torsion is combined with other loading, such as bending, set KC equal to one. And then the von Mises analysis that we'll do is going to to manage that by combining everything. So unless you have pure axial loading, you're just gonna set KC equal to one and then deal with everything through binding C's. Okay, temperature factor. Oh, this was just like the funniest equation and it took me so long to type it in um, PowerPoint. But for operating temperatures below room temperature, brittle fracture is a strong possibility and should be investigated first because when, um, the materials are cold, they behave more like brittle materials. So above room temperature yielding should be investigated first and um, yield strength drops off rapidly with increased temperature. So that is essentially what this KD is accounting for. We're just gonna be looking at things in room temperature um, for ease of you know, calculation and we're just reviewing the concepts. But just know that if you had a, something other than room temperature, you would have to modify. And um, I don't think you should definitely memorize that. That was kind of a joke. This is just an interesting figure. It shows the effect of operating temperature on the ultimate strength of steel. It's just showing that um, the ST is the tensile strength, the operating temperature, so whatever is the actual temperature, versus room temperature, and you see that that ratio goes down as the temperature increases. Reliability factor, KE, um, basically there is just a lot of scatter and fatigue testing data. Um, you don't have to use this equation. So if you're given a certain amount of reliability, for example, 50% reliability, your reliability factor KE would be one. And this reliability doesn't mean that you have a 50-50 shot of your part failing in fatigue loading. This is the reliability that the standard deviation of the reported endurance strength doesn't exceed 8% of its mean value. So I think what this basically means is that the, the higher re reliability that you, you set is essentially saying that you are, you know, more sure that the reported endurance limit that you're using, the endurance limit that you're using is uh, closer to test values. But it's something that has to be given to you in the problem statement. All right, and then lastly, miscellaneous effects factor, KF. This is really meant to be kind of a reminder or a wild card where you can account for any other conditions you believe will decrease the endurance limit. So corrosion or electrolytic plating or metal strain. Some of these things are used because it does increase corrosion resistance, but it can reduce the, the fatigue strength or fretage. So anything that's anything that's putting like little bumps or grooves because fatigue failure happens at cracks. So um, when we have a bumpy surface, cracks are more likely to happen. And then about stress concentrations in more detail. 
the holes, grooves, and notches increase the stress in the immediate vicinity of the discontinuity. So in 328, we defined static stress concentration factors, KT and KTS. So the little s was when you had loading and shear, KT was for um, bending or axial loading. This little zero, this is nominal, that's what that means. And then, for example, your, your maximum shear stress is the product of the stress concentration factor times the nominal stress, which for us in that class is usually TC over J. Okay, so with ductile versus brittle materials, there's a, a difference in how they behave. So ductile materials have uh, localized yielding at the, or the presence of a discontinuity, so the material they had a hole, and this for ductile. So the stress will concentrate around this hole, but you'll also get some localized yielding and strain hardening, which serves to strengthen the part at that, at that hole, that discontinuity. So we don't usually apply the stress concentration factor to ductile materials for this reason, but we do account for the reduced geometry. So sigma P over A, that still holds true, obviously, for a ductile material. But if you were looking at the max stress, you'd use the area reduced. But you wouldn't necessarily have to tack on the additional AT for that. But in fatigue loading, you always have to use stress concentration factors, even when you do have a ductile material. We used reduced values of stress concentration factors. So KF and KFS. So this is torsion, anything that produces shear stress. This is for bending, for axial loading. And then Stress concentration factors are reduced in fatigue loading, so they're not as high as the static stress concentration factors. And that's um, basically, I think of it because if something is oscillating between tension, compression, tension, and compression, there's some point in time where the fibers aren't in tension or compression, so you get a little stress relief. So that's the way that it makes sense, best sense to me that we use these reduced factors for stress concentrations and fatigue. Okay, two more slides, I promise. Notch sensitivity Q. Materials have different sensitivities to stress concentrations, which is referred to as the notch sensitivity of a material. So in general, the more ductile a material is, the less notch sensitive it is. Brittle materials are more sensitive to notches because in a brittle material, a little notch is going to propagate a crack a lot um, faster, a lot greater than a ductile material. Notch sensitivity also depends on notch radius. And then notch sensitivity is experimentally determined. It ranges from zero to one. When you get a Q equals zero, your material has no notch sensitivity. And then Q equals one, material has full notch sensitivity. This would be the conservative approach, but it's not what we we usually use. We go through the process to figure out what our KF is through Q. So procedure determine KT first, then Q, material dependent, then KF. Let's do a little example. Um, let's say we had, just pick something easy. Say we had a, a component that had an ultimate strength of 150, APSI and uh, notch radius of, easy to read, 0 0.06. Oh God, it's over. I don't know, that looks about Q equals 0 0.88. So that's how to read that chart. Um, notch radius in inches is down below, notch radius in millimeters is up top, and then you have lines that are shared. 
So I found that trying to interpolate Q for bending or axial and Q for torsion from the charts is a big pain in the butt. And it's pretty problematic in terms of how we all might interpret the chart differently. So in this class, I'm going to have you actually program Q into your analysis tool. So I just took a screenshot from the textbook. So there's your Q. And your square root of A is going to be different depending on if you have bending or axial loading and torsion. So it's kind of a pain. I mean, there's a lot of exponents. You have to go slowly. But you will really benefit from having this into your tool. So I am going to be looking for Q as an exact value on the quizzes and the midterm. And if you have the 10th edition of the book, this page is page 304. OK, so what will KQ5 quiz cover? Questions pertaining to shaft materials and layout that were presented earlier in this KQ. Being able to report stress concentration estimates without specified geometry, so that would be using table 7-1. Being able to report actual stress concentration estimates once geometry has been given to you. Conceptual questions about fatigue from this KQ, as well as that intro to fatigue video that was embedded within this KQ. And then lastly, using the Marin equations to calculate the endurance limit of a shaft given relevant parameters.